Adult recreational use of marijuana is now legal in eight states and the District of Columbia, and 29 states have embraced some form of medical marijuana legalization. There's even a pot plant cultivation competition at the annual Oregon State Fair, and by 2015, legal cannabis had become the fastest growing industry in the United States, and it's expected to hit $7.1 billion this year. Now, despite this progress, nearly 700,000 people were arrested last year for violating marijuana laws, and while marijuana Marijuana-related offenses aren't punishable by death, some offenders are hit with other penalties with effects that can ripple throughout their lifetime, like the loss of a job or public benefits because of life sentences. Others, like Pharrell Scott, are being separated from their families to serve life sentences for violating federal marijuana statutes. And marijuana laws don't seem to be enforced equally. According to the ACLU, it reports that blacks and white Americans use cannabis at roughly the same rate, but black arrest rates are far higher. Now here to discuss some of the often forgotten victims of the U.S. war on drugs is Sherry Sickard. She's the founder and executive director of the Marijuana Lifer Project, a nonprofit organization fighting for an end to the criminalization of marijuana and the release of those imprisoned for marijuana-related offenses. And I began by asking her how these laws got so outrageous that nonviolent offenders are facing life sentences for pot. Check it out. It's really uh, something that a lot of people misunderstand and, and why it is goes back to the start of the drug war and, and that's a much bigger topic than we have time to discuss now. But uh, for the people I advocate for, I'm the, the director of the Marijuana Lifer Project. We advocate for prisoners serving life sentences for marijuana. What got most of them into trouble is the conspiracy laws and the public really doesn't understand much about conspiracy laws in this country. And it really shocks people that this can happen. Uh, when I talk about people serving light for marijuana, people naturally assume, well, they must have been importing tons and tons, and some of them were, but many of them weren't at all and never touched it, never had anything to do with it at all uh, in a direct way. Or they, people assume, well, they must have had lots of prior offenses, they're career criminals. Some of them did, but some of them are first-time offenders. You know, so that is also a misconception. What people don't understand about conspiracy is it takes almost nothing to be cons convicted of a conspiracy. Uh, you, me, everybody listening is probably guilty of a conspiracy of some sort. So what people need to realize is, one, it takes no actual evidence to get convicted of conspiracy. All it takes is the word of somebody else uh, that was involved and that somebody else is usually trying to avoid prison time themselves. And uh, it holds also one person equally responsible, regardless of how much or how little they did. So among the men I advocate for, some of them were importing a lot of weed. Some of them were really minor players, like we have uh, Craig Cecil, who repaired trucks that were used to haul marijuana, or uh, Leopoldo Hernandez Miranda, who watched the house where marijuana was stored. So uh, conspiracy is uh, pretty shocking to most people when they really understand how it can work against an average citizen. And once you get caught in the justice system, it's impossible to get out. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to talk about clemency for a bit. Why hasn't marijuana legislation um, translated into clemency for those in prison uh, for marijuana uh, offenses? And how are their Americans still being given life or de facto life sentences as recent as this year um, for these offenses? I wish I had the answer of why it's not being translated and I hope as more and more states legalize then that will become more of a push. We have seen that historically when alcohol prohibition ended, but um, we are one of the few countries in the first world where prisoners do not automatically get out when laws change, so they still have to petition to get out. Um, it hasn't been a total failure. Um, there have been some clemencies for marijuana offenders. Uh, several of the uh, prisoners I advocate for have gotten out over the past couple of years. Uh, Charles Cundiff, Billy Deco, Craig Frazier, uh, just this year, but many more have been denied. So I'm really hoping that they don't fall through the cracks, that um, I'm really grateful to President Obama because he's done so many clemencies, but proportionately very few of them have been for marijuana-only crimes. And now the Justice Department's Office uh, of the Pardon Attorney and the White House Counsel are working to deny um, clemency to Americans serving life sentences uh, for possession and distribution of marijuana. What reasons have they given all of you um, to why they're being denied clemency and why do you think they're giving you that very specific answer? 
were never given a reason. They just get a letter that they were denied. So there's, there is no real reason usually. Uh, there's also no real reason when, when they are given clemency. I mean, the president can give clemency to anyone he wants. So we don't really know why they're being denied. It really boggles my mind. Um, our longest serving prisoner, for instance, Antonio Bascaro, he is 82 years old and he's been in 37 years and his clemency was denied. He's a de facto life. So he'll be out in another year, uh, year and a half, I believe, if he lives that long. Um, most of these guys are senior citizens that have been in for decades, but the practice, as you mentioned, is still going on. Um, our newest lifer, Corvain Cooper, got a life sentence in 2014. So we're still doing this. It's not a relic of the past. And obviously there needs to be a lot more action taking place on a local level. Um, what can people do to help uh, these harsh sentencing laws and penalties, especially in terms of getting um, our communities uh, involved in anti-criminalization efforts? I mean, how can we start basically a grassroots movements to uh, change the laws. Well, there's a lot of things starting at the local level, which is pay attention to the judges that you're electing. And because really judges have a direct impact on the public and most people know nothing about the people they're voting for, for judges. Same goes with the politically appointed judges. So a lot of this starts at that level. We also need to see reform of the clemency process, of the way um, that is reviewed, because right now it kind of is up to the people who are in the same department that prosecuted these people to decide that they're worthy of clemency. So it kind of almost uh, is set up as a situation where they have to admit they were wrong or made a mistake or maybe it shouldn't have been this harsh. Uh, this, it's just the system is inherently flawed. So I think a push to reform that whole system would be important. And of course, sentencing reform, mandatory minimums, this is a very complex issue. But uh, I think, and it's disheartening to me if we can't solve it at the level of something as basic as somebody with a nonviolent marijuana crime doing life without parole, which some of these guys have life without parole. Think about that. Not even a chance of ever getting out. If we can't solve that, I mean, how broken is the system? Thank you so much, Sherry.